Hey, what's up? It's Martin with Analog Vibes. Welcome back to the second episode of this Build a Legend series number four, featuring one of the rarest and most beautiful sounding compressors limiters of all times, namely the 176 variable limiting amplifier. But before we jump right into today's video, I just want to say, wow, thank you so much for all your feedback, the comments, the emails I received, you know, it completely exceeded my expectations. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you in the name of the entire crew. It really means a lot to us and it helps a lot. So thank you so much for your engagement. And it also makes me feel like you sense that this compressor is something really unique, you know, and maybe I can, I can show you and make you see that building one for yourself is not completely out of reach. All right. So today's episode is mostly about deciphering how the 176 does its magic, you know, how it actually works. We talk about some of the components and the parts and we'll talk about how much it will cost to build one. But I'll also take the opportunity to address some of your, your questions in regards to potential modifications. All right, so now let's take a closer look at what's actually going on here. If we break the circuit down in its basic components as a first step, it looks like this. From the input, the signal goes straight to the variable gain stage, which revolves around the 6BCA tube. This tube controls the core of the 176's unique compression principle. Simultaneously, a portion of the signal is sent to the detector circuit, essentially the compressor sidechain, built around the 6AL5 tube. And this detector circuit determines how much gain the 6BC8 applies to the signal and together they form the variable compression circuit of the unit. So this is where the magic happens, folks, all right? But I'll explain it in more detail a little bit later on. From there, the signal is sent to the makeup gain stage based on a 12AX7 and a 12BH7 tube before passing on to the 176's output. Now, of course, all of this is an extremely simplified overview, but it's important to approach the circuit step by step, you know, in order to get your head around it. So taking a closer look, there's definitely more happening under the hood. The first thing the signal encounters inside the 176 is the input knob, or more specifically, the input attenuator. This controls the volume before the signal enters the circuit and plays a crucial role in how the compressor responds to the signal. Next, the signal hits the input transformer, which balances it and adjusts the impedance for the compressor stage. After this, the signal splits. Most of it goes directly into the 6BCA2, while a smaller portion is sent to the sidechain circuit. The 6BCA8 is a remote cutoff double triode tube. It sounds complicated, but what it actually does, it varies gain based on the control voltage applied to its grid. This variable gain property is essential to the variable compression principle. So how does this work? Here's the thing. The part of the signal routed to the sidechain determines the control voltage that dynamically alters the grid bias of the 6BC8. The higher this control voltage, the lower the tube's gain, resulting in more gain reduction. But where does this control voltage come from? Remember now, the audio signal is split after the input transformer. So the portion that goes to the sidechain goes through a series of components. Let me draw them first and then I'll explain. First, we have the attack and release pots, which technically speaking are both variable resistors. They are followed by the 6AL5 tube and a capacitor, C6. Now, what's happening here? While audio is an AC signal, the 6BCA tube needs a DC control voltage to operate effectively. This is where the 6AL5 tube comes in. It acts as a rectifier, converting the AC sidechain signal into DC control voltage. Before reaching the 6AL5, the signal passes through the two variable resistors, the attack and release pods. These resistors directly affect how quickly the capacitor, C6, charges and discharges, which in turn influences the response time of the control voltage generated by the 6AL5 tube. In simpler terms, that means exactly what you know of a compressor with attack and release. The attack pod controls how fast the compression reacts to certain peaks in the audio signal, while the release pod determines how long the compression effect lasts before returning to its default state. Now there's still one piece missing to complete the sidechain circuit. 
the ratio switch. This switch controls how much the signal gets compressed once it crosses a certain threshold. But Bill Putnam's approach to achieving this was particularly ingenious. Instead of conventional methods, he used a series of resistors switchable to different taps of the output transformer, which alters the DC control voltage that's being forwarded to the grid of the 6BC8. And that's why in short, the threshold of the compressor changes with the ratio setting. I'll explain this procedure in more detail in an e-paper I created, but I'll tell you more about that e-paper in a minute. First, let's go full circle here. Now that the compression is being taken care of, all we need is one of the best sounding tube amps on the planet and we're good to go. Lucky for us, the 176 has just that. The 12th AX7 boosts the overall signal level, adding some lovely harmonics to the mix. But it's not doing it alone. Its homie MC12BH7 steps in knowing exactly what the output transformer loves and dresses the package up in vibrant colors before proudly handing it over. The output transformer is absolutely thrilled and adds a few extra hues out of excitement before passing the signal to the output pod for a last step of volume control as the makeup gain. Those of you already familiar with the three iconic knobs e-paper, which explains the working principle of an LA-2A might now think, hang on, 12H7 and a 12BH7, ain't that the same tubes as an LA-2A? Yes, that's right, but that LA-2A utilizes a push-pull configuration with the 12BH7 as a feedback tube. That means <clears throat> it's um, much more transparent. It's like actually a very transparent uh, amplifier for a tube amp. The you know, 176 in turn utilizes a single ended amplifier configuration with the 12H7 as the driver and the 12BH7 as the output tube with, uh, without such feedback. So that results in a more distinct, fatter and colorful tube sound. In fact, the 176, you know, even with the compressor switched off, is one of the best sounding tube amps I've ever heard. Now, if you know me, you know that I won't let you leave with empty hands after such a video. So, and I mentioned, uh, I created an e-paper and everything I just explained, you know, and even more, like how to use the 176, how the controls work, how the threshold and the ratio are connected, etc. All of this and more you can find in the three stages of Mojo e-paper I created and you can download it for free right next to this video. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I put the link in the description below, all right? Now, let's talk parts. In the last video, I mentioned that putting together a completely for the 176 was by far our most challenging project to date and I really meant it. When I built my first prototype back then, I spent literally months to source the right parts, you know, and even back then some of the rare parts were almost impossible to track down. And I mean, you know, sometimes I had to convince myself for weeks just to justify the prices. For an example, the original A19 interstate transformer, just the transformer alone back then went for $450. And today it's practically non-existent. Same story with the UTC-01 input transformer. Back then it was just below $300 and today it's become unobtainable. So <laughs> you can imagine the headaches, you know, that come with trying to make a full kit when the most critical parts are nowhere to be found. But we were determined and we didn't let that stop us. So back then when we did the 9067 Silver Face uh, complete kit, we connected with AMI in the United States and they custom made transformers for us matching vintage specs and they were able to do this back then because they already had the original designs of the A10 and A24 transformers which which are required for the LE2A in the drawers and they absolutely nail it so this time for the 176 we even took it a step further we asked them if they would reverse engineer our vintage UTC A19 and O1 transformers and you know let me just say, massive shout out to Dennis and the entire team over at AMI. They accepted the challenge with open arms and spent so much time. We, we, you know, we went back and forth. And just so you get an idea, you know, this here is the first prototype they sent us. So we installed it in the 176. We measured it. We measured the frequency response. We compared it to the original back and forth. This here is prototype number three. So you kind of see where I'm going here, you know, how much work and time and, you know, effort we spent to get it right. And this is what we end up with. So it's just so amazing because this is really, 
indistinguishable from the original inside and out you know i just want to emphasize how crucial it is for a passion driven project like analog vibes you know that is much more about a labor of love than big business how crucial it is to find partners like ami because usually when we approach manufacturers with something like transformers they have a minimum order quantity of 10,000 pieces are you kidding me and it wasn't just the transformers for example finding high quality 600 ohm t-pads was another challenge because the commercially available ones today they just don't cut it and so we reached out to blower edwards in the uk they make uh, switches and pots for neve for example and uh, they also supplied us with uh, custom made switches and pots for our project in the past so they came up with this beautiful 600 ohm t-pad following original specs and it has a wonderful feel to it and yeah the list goes on you know these uh big wonderful rca knobs for example there are some kind of clones out there but they're not really close we painstakingly model ones ourselves uh from the ones we have here and we'll have those manufactured for us specifically for the kit so yeah some might call us crazy i call it love for detail and you know if you do something do it right or just don't do it at all now we could talk about parts for hours you know about the custom made pcbs the turret boards the custom switches etc but maybe we can talk about that a little bit more in the next episode because there's two more things i definitely want to talk about with you right now number one what all of you are most definitely itching to know is how much is it going to cost to build one the full kit with everything included you know even the wires with a step-by-step -step build guide that makes it pretty much painting by numbers uh, this entire kit will be 24.99 euros now some might say this is quite some money for a DIY kit and yes that's true but here's the thing in my opinion there is uh, different reasons to DIY your own gear you know beyond that uh, deep personal impact I was talking about earlier that uh, you know goes way deeper than you can imagine if you haven't done it before reason number one is to get your hands on gear that is otherwise too expensive for you the SSL 4000 bus compressor is a really good example. It's a good beginner project. You know, the parts to build it are super cheap. Uh, there is no tubes, no um, transformers, no rare parts. You can get pretty much everything off the shelf. Another reason to DIY your own gear is to get your hands on gear that is otherwise completely out of reach. You know, like not available anymore, like to no one, no matter how much you are willing to spend. And this is where this project is coming in. You know, my goal was to to uh, make the 176 available again like in its full glory you know not just some kind of clone you know no corners cut no compromise as close as possible to the real deal as we can get and that's what we did and that's where we ended up oh i love it great stuff now one more thing for this video in the last episode i was asking if you were interested in some uh, possible modifications and i got quite some feedback one of you was asking if it was possible to add uh, light to the VU meter. That's right, the VU meter of the original 176 is not illuminated. The only indicator that it's running is that little pilot lamp down there. So since the VU meters in our kit will be made by SciFam, I can't imagine they have some sort of illumination kits for the meters available. Um, but the space is rather tight and you have to be aware the 176 is an open frame design there is no lid so if you install a lamp here the light not only shines through the view meter but basically through your entire rack right another question i got asked was if it was possible to make the meter switchable from the front and um, as you can read in the e-paper i mentioned before with the 176 you had to flip the front open in order to reach that hidden meter switch inside of the unit so you can switch the meter from gain reduction to output or to input and uh, in the 175b this switch is located right here but in the 176 the spot has already been taken by the ratio switch so they had to move it inside and uh, frankly this is quite impractical you know in daily use because uh you know i don't want to always reach inside so i was thinking about how to fix this without um altering the front panel so that's also one of the beauties of DIY. What I did is I just replaced the, the pot behind the vernier, output vernier control knob with a push-pull pot. So in its regular position, it shows gain reduction, but if I pull the knob, 
the meter shows output levels. And that's basically all I need. I added another modification in a similar way. There is a jumper on the 176 mainboard and with it you can set the input to low gain or to high gain. But it's not really a jumper as you might expect in a modern piece of equipment. It's more like you have to hardwire it to either one of these positions. So in high gain the 176 has 10 dB more input gain. Which basically allows you to drive the signal against the threshold 10 dB earlier. And that can come in really handy at times and makes this unit even more versatile. In theory. Because in real life, no one would take this thing out of the rack during a recording or mixing session, you know, and fumble around inside with a soldering iron just to set it from low gain to high gain. So what I did is, similar to what I did over there, I just replaced the part behind the input vanier with a push-pull part. So in its regular position, it's in low gain mode, and if I pull the knob, it's in high gain mode. Both of these modifications don't alter the looks of the 176, nor do they alter the original circuit. They only take what's already there and make it more accessible. So now for the kit, my question to you is, should you decide to grab one of these kits, uh, would you prefer the regular parts or would you prefer the push-pull parts I added uh, to give you access to more of the feature the original 176 actually offers? Please let me know in the comments. Also, if there is anything else you're still curious about regarding this project, just drop it in the comments below as well and I try my best to cover it in the next and final episode. In that one, we'll also dive into the build guides I was talking about before so you know what you're getting into. And for those completely new to the Build Your Legends game, I will break down how the pre-orders work. Alright, the final episode drops this Sunday, just in time before the pre-orders open, so if you have any questions left now is the right time to ask all right so and um yeah if you haven't subscribed to the newsletter yet and you don't want to miss the final you know what to do and i'll catch you on sunday peace